But at the time, I think that when I was emailing with these people, they didn't know it was like the Natalie from the videos. Oh, okay. And then we'd get on a Zoom call or have a meeting and they'd be like, wait a minute. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, it is it's me. <laughs> um, but, and that was always interesting too. A lot of the times where I'd be talking on the phone to these, you know, business execs and whatnot. And then I'd meet them in person and they always thought I was like much older or, you know, a different person entirely. And yeah. I was like, no, it's just me, you know. <laughs> I'm Tom Ward. And over the last couple of years, I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On the show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is The Tom Ward Show. Welcome to the Tom Ward Show, where we talk to the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. Today, we've got Natalie Maraduena, aka Natalie <laughs> Noel. She's an entrepreneur. She's a creator. She's a model. You do a bunch of things. And I'm really fascinated by your career because you go from, you know, we all knew you as David's assistant to now you're full blown creator. Um, but you're doing business stuff in the background to now kind of you're president of David Dobrik LLC. So you're the boss now. <laughs> and kind of when I was doing my homework and I was reading up on you, it seems like the one common thread I see for your success is you take any opportunity in front of you and like go a thousand percent and like make the most of it. Like, <laughs> do you think that's part of your success or um, that reason for that's it? That's very kind, but <laughs> <laughs> semi-accurate, I would say. Um, but yeah, I think that I was presented incredible opportunities and um, was lucky to have such a great friend that was able to give me such amazing opportunities. And um, But I, I definitely seized what those were along the way and made the most of them and did my best and worked my hardest so that I could be in the position that I am in today and have the opportunities that I had along the way. Um, but yeah, I'm very, very humbled and very um, fortunate. So yeah. We'll talk later too. I talked to your buddy, Jason Nash. Shout out Jason. <laughs> and I want to get like some stories, you know, some good press on I'm you. I'm sure kind of, he has some good ones. Oh, I'm sure. He, I'm sure he probably saved some too, you know. Yeah. But the one thing he said, one of many things he said was, Natalie does everything at the highest level, no matter what, whether she's planning a party or whether she's, <laughs> you know, getting 12. What did he say? We needed 12 child actors we needed a tutu and we wanted to blow up a house <laughs> in less than 24 hours and david said there's no way she could pull this off yet you did yeah there is many instances i think it's funny because i obviously started out as david's assistant and um in the very early days i was never on camera or anything i was solely answering emails getting lunch you know the very basic bare minimum things and then um it just sort of slowly progressed into me being on camera and me being more part of the production value of everything that was happening. And as goofy and funny as all the videos were, there was so many things going on behind the scenes that people probably don't even understand how much effort and how much time it takes to put something like that together because you get four minutes of it, but there's, you know, days and days of it behind the scenes. And um, that was all me. And it's actually, it's really funny to look back at it now because now we've built this sort of team around us that's helping support we're not even making blogs every week mm -hmm. right and that was the craziest time of our lives was producing those videos and it was just me and david making all those videos getting everything done hiring actors getting animals you know <laughs> whatever the whatever the task was but it's crazy to look back and think like i can't believe you were doing that multiple times a week just us you know <laughs> well, talk about that so before you know you're an assistant for like a year before we even see you on camera so talk about that then right so you didn't even this was never the plan right <laughs> no. didn't david have an empty house yeah you're his buddy from chicago the suburbs and he says hey can you come out and help me decorate yeah. right yeah and then he offers you a job when you're here <laughs> but this was never the plan no definitely not i mean david moved out to la and i went to college and as I was going into my senior year of college, he had just bought a home in the hills. And I was confused beyond belief. I was like, <laughs> what are you doing that you can afford this like multi-million dollar yeah. home? And, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I knew, you know, I knew that he was creating content, but I wasn't really actively watching his YouTube videos. And um, I he ended up, he bought this home and it was just vacant for like three to four months. Like a single guy. Yeah, yeah like a typical bachelor. <laughs> yeah. And um, and he was like, you know, do you want to come out? I'll fly you out for two weeks. You know, I'll give you my credit card. You can go buy couches and rugs. And I was like, this is a girl's dream come true. Like, I would <laughs> love to do that. Um, so I did. So I came out in the summertime and um, decorated his home. And while I was there, he 
it was like, would you want to be my assistant? And, you know, I'll pay you a full-time salary and all these, you know, things. And you can, you can live here and it'll be great. And I was like, I mean, it sounds amazing, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I still have one year left of college and I was studying to be, you know, I was a psychology, environmental science double major. Oh, so wow. psychology is good to have, you know, as a background being around those guys. <laughs> yeah, psychology definitely still was applicable in this scenario. Um, but just not what I had envisioned I'd be doing with yeah. my career. Um, did you look like, because I was thinking about that, I'm like, she's well educated, you know, she's got it together. At the time, did you, were you kind of like, I didn't go to college to become an assistant. Like I had big. <laughs> Let alone David's assistant. Yeah. The, the, my the, childhood the, best friend. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't, I'm going to work for you. Yeah. No. No, I definitely had that, that, that moment for sure. And what we ended up sort of like agreeing on was I had to finish school. I'd already put in all this money and time and effort. So I was like, I want to finish. I'll finish, you know, I'll double up on my classes and finish early, a semester early. And um, then in my second semester of senior year, I'll come out here for an internship. <laughs> and I somehow- At Dobrik Enterprises. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I somehow convinced my advisor to, and I hope that she never sees this, but <laughs> um, to let me have that internship credit and live out there and report remotely and whatnot. And my advisor that was reporting back to my college advisor mm -hmm. was actually me. Yeah, I was going to say, because there's no way David's filling up these weekly <laughs> forms, right? Not, no, no. Um, which was kind of funny. But um, so I did my six month internship out with David Dobrik LLC <laughs> and I loved it. And I was just like, I didn't understand the opportunity that he was presenting me at the time. And then after I had that sort of couple months of experience, I was like, OK, whoa, this is like a full blown career. This is like the new age sort of um, business and entertainment and all that. And um, the people that I had met, whether it was business-wise or celebrities that we were working with, it was just opportunities that I never would have imagined and never would have had otherwise. Um, and that was really exciting oh, to a 21-year-old sure. girl that was just, you know, I love pop culture. I love entertainment. I always have. But I never knew how to sort of break into that realm of business and no one in the sh in your hometown knows a kardashian right <laughs> you know or, or gets to Absolutely go to these no. events yeah no it, I mean, it's not even like tangible no not at all and um yeah so it was just it was a very exciting thing and um i saw the potential and opportunity behind it and so i stayed and it was the best decision i ever made and oh, now i'm here <laughs> no doubt. was there a like what was the vision at the time i mean david at the time was getting around a million views a video what was going on behind the scenes at the time? Like, what did you, what was going on? And then where did you see this thing kind of going for you? Um, you know, every, at that time, back in 2018, I think it was, um, it was all about the videos. Like David didn't really, he had tunnel vision for like, you know, I have to make this, this is my job, right? I have to make these videos and I have to supply my audience with content each week. And that was the only thing he cared to focus on. But there was all these other opportunities like brand deals and sponsorships and merchandise lines and all that that could make so much money that people don't even understand, which I didn't understand at the time either until I saw the numbers and I was like, holy cow, <laughs> somebody needs to be focusing on this. And so um, I just sort of stepped into that role because someone needed to do it and mm -hmm. there was nobody doing it. So, um, yeah, and I just I just sort of took on the emails more and had conversations with people and reached out to people. And um, David had a manager at the time, too, that I would work alongside with all the time. And, um, yeah, just sort of try to get deals done and make some money. <laughs> Where was the – because I remember the first time I met you, I interviewed David a couple times, but it was at his old house. And I'll never forget – Ever. So after the interview, there's you're there, you know, you're the boss and he's got the pool table there that was kind of on the right hand side and there was just merch all over it and there was new merch. He's like, hey, check out my new merch, whatever. So I'm looking at it. And then I asked him, I go, David, how much merch do you sell? Because to me, a regular guy, I have no idea. Like, is it 10 grand a week? Is it like, what is it? <laughs> And he said, and he said it on camera later too, so I feel comfortable <laughs> saying the story. He told me that the wind or Black Friday, Thanksgiving weekend, so Black Friday to the Cyber Monday at the time, he did a million dollars in merch. And I almost fell over <laughs> because I couldn't even fathom. I mean, that's yeah. a lot of hoodies. A lot of merchandise, a lot of, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. Like, was that his biggest source of income at the time when you started? Was it merch and then kind of the brand deals and stuff was like secondary? Yeah, for sure. So um, the merch was always, I think, seen as a way for the audience to support him and to be a part of what we were creating because David wore the merchandise every single week 
ate, slept, breathed in the merchandise as well as our friends. And so it was a way for the audience to sort of feel more connected. And in turn, they bought a lot of hoodies and a lot of sweatpants. <laughs> for real. Um, but yeah, no, it was great. It was it was definitely his highest um, stream of income mm-hmm. at that time, for sure. And what did the, like, the other business side like look like? The, you know, the brand deals and yeah. like the other streams? Um, well, this is also widely known, too, that his YouTube channel made zero dollars. He never made any money from YouTube, which is really interesting being <laughs> <laughs> like David the biggest star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but so we had no choice but to make money otherwise, you know, other places because we had to make the videos, which costs a lot of money. Giving away a car is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the brand deals definitely helped. But even with the brand deals too, like we would partner with SeatGeek, right? Constantly to give away cars, tuition, MacBooks, whatever it was. And all that money that they would give would have to go because you got to pay taxes on things. So immediately, a lot of creators come. forget about that when yeah. they're starting out and uh, <laughs> they get hit with a bill. Yeah, that's one you got to watch out for. <laughs> <laughs> um, taxes are no joke. No joke. <laughs> um, but so you know, half the money's already gone, and now you got to buy a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar car. So it's you know, it's you do the math. But most you know, most of the money was gone mm-hmm. with those with those sponsorships. But that's all that mattered, and that's you know. Putting the money, 100% of the money back into the videos is what also made the videos so great. Beast has the same philosophy. Yeah. I just read he spent $100,000 on a thumbnail. Yeah. Because, like, he's that obsessed. Like, the thumbnail, yeah. everything has to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jimmy's, I mean, Jimmy is next level. He's, I mean, incredible what he does and the way that he's mastered his craft. And um, it's amazing. David, too. I mean, you know, they, they've they studied it. Like, this is their job. Like you said before, like, David said, this is my job and I've got to create content and I am laser focused on my job. Like, this isn't a hobby. This is something I'm just doing on the weekends. Like, yeah. this is it. I'm going to go a thousand percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. And um, something that David actually always says, too, which I think is really interesting, is that his and I'm sure he said this to you in prior interviews as well, but um, that his his dad told him, whatever your job is, whether you're a garbage man, whether you're, you know, this successful YouTuber, whatever it is, you go 100 percent, you give everything you have. And he does that to his best, the best of his ability. And that's what made him so successful. So. Oh, no. And you kind of follow the same. <laughs> trying like, to follow that mantra. Yes, well. yeah. it does. <laughs> so you're doing all this. Now, all of a sudden. He brings you in front of the camera mm-hmm. and you're the assi- you're Natalie, the assistant that we all love and kind of like <laughs> it's kind of a character, you know, it's kind of like making fun of the assistant a little bit, too. Now you're doing that. And I wanted to ask you, so you're doing that. Of course, anybody associated with David, your social is going to blow up. Now you're a creator yourself. Right. Now you're in your own brand deals. Yeah. Now you're making your own money. Yeah. But you also have this other job <laughs> <working> <laughs> for David. So. First of all, I guess my first question is, how did you manage doing both? Because in the vlog world, what I don't think a lot of people understand is, and I don't know how vloggers do it because there's extreme burnout because it never ends. Mm -hmm. You need videos every day or three days a week or whatever your posting schedule is. So you're keeping up with all that, right? Mm -hmm. And you're doing your own thing. Plus you're handling the business side. Like, how did you manage that? (laughs) Um, I was a very busy woman, (laughs) that's for sure. Um, No, but I mean, I was like, you know, I think what's really great about the type of videos that we were making at the time, too, was that we were surrounded by our friends. So a lot of it was just us naturally interacting. Right. And so, um, you know, it didn't feel like I was having to, like, report into work. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was always just a natural like somebody was doing something goofy all the time. Right. And it was going to be captured on camera. And if I happen to be there, great. Um, If not, you know, whatever. But it was. um I always found time to like, most people also, I think it's also kind of funny too, is a lot of our friends at that time, a lot of the content was filmed at night, right? Like we would go out on the town and, you know, crazy things would happen, interact with people and whatnot. So I would wake up early in the morning and just get all my work done like before noon or one, you know, and then I would make time to go out and vlog with David and do his thing with him. Um, It was a lot of time, time management, honestly. And I I don't know how I did it either, to be honest. I don't really know what the key or the right word is (laughs) to say, but I did it. I, you know, I knew what I had to get done and I I did it. (laughs) So I was going to ask you too. So you're doing this, you're kind of blowing up as a creator. We all know you as Natalie, the assistant. Yeah. But are you kind of fighting that when you're dealing with the CMO of (laughs) Kraft, right? Right. Or the CEO of whatever company, Fortune 500 company you're working with, you're like, Wait, is that the girl who's in the video? <laughs> like, why is she emailing me about this and wants, you know, yeah, I think people, data from me? I think, um, and that was that was honestly, like, the highlight of my job, too, was getting to work with all these brands that, you know, you grew up on in your childhood, like Kraft or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, you, you can get on the phone with them immediately. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
that was really exciting. And so, but at the time, I think that when I was emailing with these people, they didn't know it was like the Natalie from the videos. Oh, okay. And then we'd get on a Zoom call or have a meeting and they'd be like, wait a minute. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, it is it's me. <laughs> um, but, and that was always interesting too. A lot of the times where I'd be talking on the phone to these, you know, business execs and whatnot, and then I'd meet them in person and they always thought I was like much older or, you know, a different person entirely. And yeah. I was like, no, it's just me, you know. <laughs> um, but that also kind of made for more interesting conversation. And I think also like a greater appreciation for me and doing business with David and myself because, you know, we were always so like tight knit and um, it just made everything kind of feel more family style oriented mm -hmm. and like authentic, I think. Because you're not just some random manager from right. an agency or whatever management company. You're invested in this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm going to be helping set this deal up, mm -hmm. you know, for your brand. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be in this. Yeah. I'm not just, you know, kind of, <laughs> okay, this is the brand deal this week. Get my and, check. And yeah, get my check and move on. Yeah, no. Yeah. Did they appreciate that? I think so. I think, um, I mean, brands in general too, like they love talking to the creator directly right if any brand you talk to any business person whatever they always want to talk to the person of course they don't really enjoy talking to the manager the representative <laughs> whatever it is which is you know i understand that you want to have that personal relationship with whoever you're working with and i think that i was a representative at the time but i was also somebody that was a part of the content and that excited them in a way mm -hmm. um and made it more enticing to want to work with us and talk to us and also encourage David to be like, yeah, go out there and like speak on my behalf and do the things for me, you know? And yeah, it just sort of worked out. <laughs> what were some of, when you look back, what were some of the deals you put together that you're like most proud of um, or that stood out to you? I mean, I think our number one, obviously, is Seek Geek. That was like the greatest partnership ever. And we have- How did that come about? Um, You know, I think David, David had done like a one-off deal with them and they have their- um, head of influencer partnerships and he is like very Ian Borthwick. Oh yeah, I know him. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's very tapped into the creator community and he just, he just knows what's happening and mm -hmm. like how to activate people properly. And when he did that first deal with David, I think that he just sort of like something clicked. Right. And it obviously worked and I'm sure there was a lot of Seek Geek David codes that were used and whatnot. And it was a successful for partnership. And so he felt comfortable giving David more money and, when David approached him and said, I want to try something new and I want to, you know, do a giveaway or I want to give away a car and I think it's going to work and it's going to convert for you. People are just going to be so excited that whatever the brand is, it's attached to something that's so positive and so rewarding. Mm -hmm. And um, and it worked. And so month after month, it was a CQ giveaway, a car, a tuition, a MacBook, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but another one that I actually we really loved um, doing was our partnership with Bumble. What did you guys do with them? We did a like college tour. So we get to go to college campuses. Oh, yeah. David would speak. We'd talk about the app. We'd do little meetups with like fans. And um, I don't think we realized at the time, you know, a lot of the times people would tell David that his audience is so young. Like, I don't know if you, you know, if I can work with you, a certain yeah. brand would say that. But um, we started doing these college tours. And I think we probably did at least 30 plus colleges that we'd go and talk to and David and I'd be on stage yeah. and, you know, whatever, goofing <laughs> around. And um, and they were really successful. Like thousands of kids would show up to each of these shows. And um, one of the tour dates that was actually the most memorable, we'll never forget it for our, our entire lives, was at UT Austin. Um, Bumble had wrapped this Mercedes G-Wagon in Bumble yellow. So it's bright. It sticks out like a sore thumb. <laughs> yeah. It's like, obviously, they're in this Bumble car. <laughs> um, they were giving a G-Wagon away? No, no, no. no. Oh, we were just like driving on it, you gotcha. know, drowning on campus. And um, all the kids sort of picked up. I'm not sure if all the classes got out at one time. It was just thousands of kids just running after this, this Bumble G-Wagon. <laughs> and that was, at that point... I, you know, the guy that was running the influencer partnerships at that time got a call from the executives there and was like, what is going on here? What are you doing? Why are all these kids so attracted to whatever you're doing? And it was really successful. And we did a bunch after that. And um, it was a lot of fun. And we just got to interact with so many people. And it was just it was really like, you know, we just walked out into the middle of a quad campus and we just hung out with people. And it was awesome. And it was really genuine and authentic. And then later that night, we'd have a show and they could ask their questions and you know, whatever. It was a really, really cool, cool experience. I think, you know, you're watching this and you see David talking about SeatGeek or we're talking about merch. 
or even if you're a brand watching this and you see, okay, he's got all these views and stuff, it doesn't mean as much as when you see it in person. And I'll give you an example. So I don't go anywhere, right? I have two little <laughs> kids and, you know, I'm in bed at 930. I don't go anywhere or do anything. But somebody invited me to some um, some fashion brand. They had a store on Sunset and they were having this like one year anniversary. I really like the clothes. I'm like, yeah, hey, let me go out. So me and my wife go, I'm like, perfect hour, Saturday at one o'clock. Like, that's my jam. <laughs> oh, God, like, I know this is I'm in. <laughs> and it was the day the Dobrik's open. And I turn on Sunset and I'm like, what? Now I'm pissed. <laughs> Traffic, right? I'm like, what is going on? I go, yeah, you know, sunset on Saturday. I go, shouldn't be that busy. But in L.A. with traffic, you don't know. Yeah. If you don't live here, there's traffic. There could be traffic <laughs> at 2 a.m. on the freeway for no reason, right? So as we get closer, I start seeing the line. And it was un believable <laughs> seeing it in person yeah it's one thing david you know posting hey we opened obricks and he's in there you know with a couple fans it's another thing to see this line i mean how long was the line it was even trending on um apple maps oh, was it really? at the time yeah because <laughs> i like crazy. i said it was all red right in front of dobricks yeah, and it yeah. said like dobricks pizza opening or something and you know, oh my god like, wow i didn't know that it's insane <laughs> um yeah that i remember that morning you know we Building up and, you know, getting closer to the launch, we were nervous. Of course. Um, we hadn't made a YouTube video in a long time and we were, you know, apprehensive about if, is that influence still there? Can we still attract all these people to come out to something like sure. this? And um, I went down early just to make sure everything was A-OK. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I turned on to Sunset from Crescent Heights Boulevard mm -hmm. and, I, and I was just driving down the street and I was like... I pray that there's a line here. You know, I pray that there's people that <laughs> Somebody have showed please up. be here. Yeah. <laughs> and what I saw, I was like, I mean, I instantly got chills. I was like, oh, sh like this is not, this is going to be crazy. It's going to be a crazy day in the best way possible. And, um, and it was, and there was thousands of kids that showed up and, and it was just, it was awesome. And everybody was so nice and like respectful. And, you know, when you draw a crowd like that, like you, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, of course. And you want everyone to be safe at the same time. And it was like, you know, the day couldn't have gone better and the whole weekend. And even now, I mean, there's still like lines that are there, yep. you know, every weekend, every day. And it's, it's crazy, but way better than we had anticipated or expected. But it's, yeah, it's been awesome. Well, I want to talk in a little bit about kind of the brands, including Dobrix yeah. and stuff you're launching. But when did it go from, and because I've seen this, you know, sitting down with a million creators, yeah. it was really the TikTokers that kind of started it where, because they saw all David's and all the ones before them kind of do this and they start out merch, you know, or no, they start out a little merch and brand deals. Okay. Yeah. Give me 10 grand. I'll promote this energy drink yeah. that I don't even drink. Who gives a, <laughs> give me the 10 grand. Right. Yeah, you yeah. know, so they do that yeah. and then they go, we could make a lot more money if we just had our own energy drink, mm -hmm. right? So then they start doing that. Now they have their own products. Yeah. And then they go, well, what if we like owned more products? And what if we invested in startups? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to make everything ourselves. Maybe we'll write a check to these people we believe in. Like was the vision of ownership there? Did you have that? And did David have that from the merch? Like was that like, hey, we're real entrepreneurs and we could create more than just doing a brand deal for for Bumble. Totally. Um, yeah, hundred percent. I think it's a matter of, I mean, for David specifically too and his businesses, he always wants to remain a hundred percent authentic, right? And not just be creating a product to put it out there and make a bunch of money and whatnot. And so it took some time to come across an idea that felt like authentic to David and that he was genuinely excited about. And we came up with Dobrik's Pizza and um That was the first one? That that's his first like owned brand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean he's he's a part he's invested in other things and all that, but this was his. This was his. Yeah. And um and he funded it completely himself and um he just he wanted to create, he's always sort of been um wanted to have a hotel or a restaurant or some sort of business that he could walk into and that he owned. And, oh, yeah. Um, and that he could just sort like a of... a home. Yeah, like, yeah, something, a place that he could just go to, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily, you know, there's products that you can put in Walmart or Target and blah, 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 but he wanted to create like an experience, right? That he could go visit himself and that other people could visit and have that same experience. And um, 
a restaurant. He obviously loves food. Who doesn't? And pizza, Chicago roots, that whole thing came together to make dough bricks. Mm -hmm. The pun on the name was obviously very enticing as well. Um, but yeah, that was sort of his, that's been his first project, his first baby. That's a hundred percent like his own. And it's been awesome. But also why it was so nerve wracking too. Like I hope people show up because it's the first thing I've Big done. Big investment. Yeah. Opening a restaurant, especially yeah. the real estate down there. God yeah. knows what rent is or whatever <laughs> the whole cost. Yeah, yeah. Now how involved, I was thinking, how involved is Natalie in this, right? So you go, <laughs> okay, I'm building a restaurant. Yeah. So there's a lot of moving parts in this. I got to find a contractor. I got to deal with, you know, are they on top of the city permits? Because right. it's LA and you need permits for everything, <laughs> right? Is who I got to meet with a designer. What's it going to look like inside? I got to get David to prove it. I get him. How were you involved in all this stuff? Were you kind of more like a project manager and putting the right people in place? Like, how do you manage a project like that? Um, so I think like, my involvement really comes from just knowing David really well and mm -hmm. knowing his interests and opinions and whatnot. And so people don't always have to, you know, nag and on him they ha can just come they nag me. on you yeah <laughs> that's what i'm there for they bother you <laughs> um but now we have Ilya fedorovich who's the ceo of dobrix he manages the contractors oh, the permits I got you. Okay. and all that um and making sure people are staying on their deadlines hiring that's all that's all him um but when it comes to like creative ideas the design of the restaurant just overall branding that sort of has been on myself and david and um, we've obviously hired third party architects, designers and things to sure. execute the ideas, but and they've executed them flawlessly. I mean, it, it looks literally amazing. could not have come out better. It looks like we always joked when we first um, saw it um, as it was being built. It, we didn't put the we put the signs up last because we didn't want anyone to obviously know that it was there. And David himself had seen the renders, but he had never seen it in person physically yet. He wouldn't drive past it on sunset until it was done and he could be surprised and okay. see it. And experience it for the first time, completely done. And um, it was like jaw on the floor when we first saw it because it literally felt like it was like out of a, a Toy Story or some yeah, sort of cartoon. Like Willy you know? Wonka or yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. The Willy Wonka pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, but yeah, no, they executed it perfectly. But now it's sort of just like managing the brand. Now we have like sort of people that want to work with Dobricks and do sponsorships and partner, you know, the whole, now the whole book is open, right? Yeah. It's um, flooding in, but yeah, it's just, now it's sort of managing that brand and like the identity of the brand and making sure we're doing cool, fun things all the time because that is the Dobrik brand. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. So to me, tell me if you agree, when I think of David Dobrik, I think fun, happy, and cool at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Now, is that the David Dobrik brand? Like you're, you have the marketing and branding. You are that person. <laughs> what is the David Dobrik brand? Um, I would say, I mean, I would say those three words are probably what I use most often. Oh, do you? Okay. <laughs> I think I stole that. I think I read you say that somewhere. I didn't um, come up with that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I, I would throw like authentic in there too, because True. what David puts online and what he shows is like genuinely his interests, whether he's promoting some goofy Amazon product or something that he found online or TikTok made me buy it or whatever, or just interacting with his friends on a daily basis. You know, it's all like very much what he does and what he likes and uh, what he enjoys. So yeah, I would say just authentic, fun, a little goofy, but cool. Has that changed from when you were his assistant early on to now? Has that brand been the same or has it kind of evolved and changed a little bit over time? Um, um, I think the like sentiment of the brand is definitely maintained the same. David is like the same person since we were like 16 to mm -hmm. now. Um, but I think now he's sort of stepping into that role of like entrepreneur and like owning a company and like having to manage, you know, Dobrix has like over 50 employees. It's like, how do you, you need to know these people, interact with these people and yeah. manage these people. And now he's sort of stepping into that entrepreneurial role where... Which is cool to see. To, yeah, it's it's great. And um, kind of transitioning from just a YouTuber to more of an entrepreneur and putting on that sort of like, he won't wear a suit willingly, <laughs> but <laughs> metaphorically putting that like suit on and taking yeah. on that role. Now you've got um, Zila Fitness as well. Yeah. Right. So was that the second project or was that going on around the same time as Dobrix? Um, that started after Dobrix. It okay. launched before Dobrix just because. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. It took a, it was easier. Easier. <laughs> quicker <yeah>. to launch. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, it launched, it launched before Dobrix, but um, Ilya and David also have been working on that together as well. And um, that's been incredibly successful and 
transforming our friends, now transforming myself. Yeah, you look amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's been, yeah, it's been a real, that's like a really cool, fun, completely different, you know, product. But um, really, really interesting. Yeah. Talk about, while we're on that too, kind of your health journey. Yeah. Because we talked before about, um, you know, you're, you've got these two jobs and, you know, you're waking up early to do emails and stuff like that. Then you're, you know, you're in the vlog, you're not kind of an actor in it, but you also have to set up the whole thing. So you're pretty much working all the time. <laughs> yeah. YouTuber burnout is a thing. Yeah. How do you, and do you have any advice for the person watching this to who works, I've worked, you know, I have a corporate background. I've worked for, you know, kind of hard charging groups where everyone's, you know, working crazy hours and all this. And it's really hard to say, hey, I got to go to the gym for an hour. <laughs> Or you know what I mean? I got to go meditate. Like, yeah. Are you crazy? You know, you got X, Y, and Z to do. You go to the yeah. gym. Who cares? You yeah, know, yeah. like this is the most important. Right. How did you find time in the middle of all that, especially with David working so hard? Like, did you make time or did you feel hesitant to kind of take care of yourself? Um, no, I think I think there was like, I feel like everybody sort of has this too, where there's like that sort of like guilt where like I'm yeah. spending time on myself and I'm not spending time on my business. Yeah. That makes me feel like I'm not working hard enough, right? Yeah. And I think that mentality is what got me out of shape to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, luckily, Zila and David are, you know, Ilya and David are both my friends. So they're both encouraging and motivating me at the same time and want me to be healthy and fit as well. And um, I think David also had a really great understanding, too, where, like, being fit and healthy is also... I'm a representative of him, right? And so putting my best foot forward and looking my best and feeling my best is only going to make him look, feel, do better. Of course. And um, so that was that was great. And they're both really, I mean, he's supportive. And I think, you know, David likes to stay up late and sleep in. So again, in the mornings, I can do my thing and <laughs> yeah. get my workout in and um, and not feel like that guilt of like, oh, I'm not working, you know? Um, but I definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I work out like seven to 8 AM. So okay. I feel like that's before. I don't know how you do it. I'm not a morning workout. <laughs> it's like before three. No, thanks. Really? Yeah. yeah I like so afternoon's better. I have to get it out of the way. Otherwise I won't do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've been doing the Zila fitness program for like, what is that? I saw you talk about that several times. Like, so what is the Zila fitness program? What is it? Um, so it's a pretty rigorous, diet and exercise program okay. um, that they've developed and they've done it with, you know, I think they've transformed three other people at this point. Okay. I'm the first female. Okay. Who were the other ones? Um, our It started with our hometown friend, John, okay. who um, we all grew up with in the same neighborhood since I actually, John and I sat next to each other in the third grade. <laughs> um, it's so cool you guys are together and you talk about <laughs> Ilya too. Like, yeah. could you imagine, just to interrupt that story for yeah. a sec, but you go, we were just three kids from the northern chicago suburbs and like we're in la <laughs> doing doing it yeah like no. doing it in entertainment and business and in our 20s that's it's crazy. pretty bad yeah it's funny we always joke about like there's too many people from burden hills in la <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any sense um but we make it work and everybody you know some of us work together and which is of, awesome yeah it's 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 like it's really cool and never would have expected it to ever be that way but and it's cool. You're close. I mean, you can tell David's a decent person because, you know, he keeps these long term relationships. And back to your story about John, you know, bringing John in to do this, <laughs> yeah. you know, program yeah. is pretty neat. Like, how did it work for him? Um, yeah, he he was always sort of like our overweight friend yes. growing up. <laughs> Everyone has one. Sure. <laughs> and um, so that was how Ilya and David were like, if you can transform John, you can transform anybody. And he ended up, he lost 50 pounds. Wow. He, has, he had a six, he had six pack abs. It was like the most, I've, I never, ever in my life would have imagined John with a six pack. We'll throw in some pictures of John here <laughs> so everybody can see him. Um, but no, his transformation was amazing. And he's still, now he's so motivated by his whole transformation that he is actually coaching personal training people on the side, like as his wow. side business. Yeah. And he's maintained it and like kept up with it. And I mean, it totally changed his life. And I think, yeah, it's been awesome for him. Everybody's ripped now. Jason's ripped. Like, know, who would have thought that? You know what I mean? Very Jason's true. like, you know, looking like one of these, you know, Instagram yeah. models. He's got his shirt off and posing and stuff. Jason loves taking his shirt off now. It's like any <laughs> opportunity, the shirt is off. <laughs> yeah, when did you guys all get in shape? Was that like, it just kind of happened organically? You know, it's funny because I feel like a lot of people took the time during the pandemic to like get healthy and yeah, stuff. True. And I think that a lot of us kind of just took that time to relax and sit back and enjoy because our life was so fast paced before that we didn't necessarily have time to do that. And, um, 
in turn, a lot of us ate some great food and gained <laughs> a little weight. Um, but now I think, I don't know what it was. I think honestly, this, the formation of Zila was what motivated everybody and seeing John get fit and being mm-hmm. like, okay, if this, if he can do this, I can I do this step too. It up. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, and the, he also the second person was um, Heath Hussar that he transformed, oh, yeah. um, and Heath looked incredible, the best he's ever looked to, and it was awesome. And then now there's me. <laughs> How's the brand doing? Um, great. Yeah, they're. Um, I mean, whenever they do their drops, every time somebody just transforms, like you know, John transformed. That was a launch of the company. Heath, they launched a collaborative product, and it you know sold out. I think twice now. But, oh, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, the marketing is, like, pretty unbeatable. You know, you see this transformation and people want to do that, too. Of Everyone course. wants to be fit and healthy. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been working out great. <laughs> now, are you involved, too, besides, like, the kind of David facing brands, you know, are you involved in other entrepreneurial things on the side, too? Do you, are you into startups? And that's big out here, too. With, in the creator community, it seems like everybody's involved in tech startups. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, definitely. I think, I mean, we have a lot of, we've invested in products, we've invested in um, tech, and I've had my own personal investments too. Um, a lot of which is just, you know, through our network of people, like we get presented with opportunities all the time. And it's a matter of sort of figuring out, okay, do I like this? Would I use this? Do I think it's going to be successful? And then, you know, give some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you look for? So you get pitched all the time, yeah. I'm sure. Like, what do you, what's most important to you? Is it the idea? If it aligns with your brand? Is it the founder? Is it a, is it a gut feeling? You know, what, um, what I th- makes you write a check? I think, I mean, a lot of it is gut, right? Mm-hmm. I think like you have to trust your gut and, um, and then I think it's also just the product and the people. Um, do I want to interact, you know, with these people and have meetings with these people on a consistent basis? Because if I don't, then I probably don't want to invest. Um, <laughs> that is an excellent point. People forget sometimes. Yeah, you have. And it's to... like this is a relationship. Like I'm gonna have to see you all the time. If I hate you, right. this is gonna suck. Right. It's not a matter of just like writing your check and bouncing. Like you're now in a relationship with this person. They're gonna ask you for things. You want to be able to rely on them for things. Um, and yeah, so that's like step one. (laughs) Um, and then also the product too, obviously has to align. And if I'm going to, you know, I want to know that I'm going to be using it on a daily basis and that I think this is something that other people will be using frequently. Um, and if that's the case, then that's already, you know, great. And then obviously you want to look at their whole business plan and see like what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Are they trying to like grow into other markets, expand, you know, whatever all those variables are. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my thought process. Yeah. What advice, you know, we're kind of wrapping up now, like what advice do you have for the young person, you know, whether they're a young entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur who wants to get started? And I think it's cool these days because, you know, you see people, it used to be like, okay, I'd have to I'd graduate college. I get a job at some corporation and maybe I work, you know, get promoted there and stay there. Or maybe I kind of get a couple more jobs and then I retire. Yeah. Right. That's it. But now you can make money, you know, if you like painting unicorns, you, know, you can have a painting unicorn TikTok yeah. channel and then make merch and uh-huh. like make a couple hundred grand a year, you know? Totally. Like, do you have any advice for those people who are kind of want to get started and do something? They don't want that corporate job. And- yeah. And if you don't want it, you definitely don't need it these days, I feel like. But um, I think, I mean, for me, something that I've always sort of stood by is like, you are your own best advocate, right? And so... What do you mean? When I'm... Like, for me, myself, like, there was a lot of people that were like, what are you doing? You're going to go to California and leave college in Chicago in this amazing place and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, like, there's a great opportunity that I think I'd be good at. And so I want to do that. And um, whether you want to paint unicorns <laughs> or, you know, start a slime channel or whatever it is, like, if you... If that's what you're genuinely passionate about then you have to be your own best advocate and you have to advocate for yourself and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I like doing. And I'm going to make my career this, or I'm going to have my success doing this this way. And, um, I think there's a lot of times too, where people, you know, I'm in rooms with people that maybe don't fully understand or you judge a book by its cover and be like, Oh, I saw you in sports illustrated. What are you doing in this room right now? I thought you were a model or I thought you were this or that. And, 
I am all of those things. Thank you very much. Yeah. But, um, and that's the- cool. I don't want to be in a room with somebody who's just this. Yeah. It's like, hey, I was in Sports Illustrated. I transformed my body. I'm yeah. inv- I own these companies. I work for this. Like, yeah. to me, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do some people not like that? It's um, like, are you... I think that a lot of times, especially when we're dealing with these companies and like these executives and whatnot that are maybe older and don't fully understand that. I mean, I'm old, but I still get it. <laughs> <laughs> people, there are lots of people that do, but yeah. there's there are some no, times, I some understand instances, what you're saying. yeah, that I think maybe think more traditionally and are you know look for somebody in a suit at a CAA or a WME to mm-hmm. be the representative of somebody, and then. There's this new person that walks in that's, you know, not that, not that. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I think but I think, yeah, just being yourself and following your passions, doing what you want to do, how you want to do it. And you find your success that way. And then one more thing, too. So the creator side, every young person, the person watching this wants to be creator. Yeah. It's a pretty good gig if you can get it. <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, what advice do you have for them to kind of getting started and to, everybody just wants to grow? Yeah. I want to grow my following. I want to blow up. Like, yeah. you know, Alex Earl. Uh-huh. <laughs> and who doesn't want to blow up like of Alex course, right now? Of course. But any advice for them? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think there was this, you know, heyday similar to Vine with the Lele's and the Logans of the world. And now in TikTok, there was Charlie and Addison and all these people that blew up. I think right now it's more difficult, right? 100%. That wave has sort of died down a little bit. It's but... so hard. It, just take Instagram. Right. It's impossible to grow on Instagram. Yeah. Like you have a better shot at TikTok. These yeah, days. 100%. But even now it's harder than it was two years ago. Right. And, but I still think the opportunity is there, right? Yep. If you're applying yourself, you're posting consistently, like that's what Alex does and a lot of other creators that are still having that blow up now. They're just posting consistently and they're sticking to what they're good at, right? Like she has a format that mm-hmm. she knows you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, she knows that it does well for her and that's what she enjoys posting mm-hmm. and she's going to do it a lot and therefore she's growing a lot and she's her own, her own woman, her own personality, her own, you know, person now. So that's, I think that's my advice, just consistency and really sticking to it. So is there anything else you want to promote or talk about? Um, I feel like we covered we it all. all. The Dobrix pizza, the Zila Fitness. Got it, got it. Um, Yeah, no, I feel great. This is fun. All right. right. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for coming. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And check out my website, TomWard.com, too, where you get two articles a week from lessons learned from all of these successful entrepreneurs I get to sit down with each and every week. So thanks for watching, guys. Mm